the first time I almost died, it was my 20th birthday. I was in Mexico with my friends, and they bought me a parasailing ride for my gift. Yeah, you've already done the math, right? So if no one's ever been parasailing, basically what it is, it's a big parachute. You're attached to it through a harness that's very tightly bound around your hips and around your shoulders. It's then attached to a 500-foot rope, and that's tied to a speedboat. And when the boatman hits the gas, you are up, whoo, and airborne. Fun, right? Yeah. So it took actually about a minute for me to start feeling the blood starting to rush from my hands and the pain starting to really kick in in my arms. Apparently, I wasn't hooked in the harness right. It was actually too loose. And ideally, what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to have the straps tucked very snugly under your armpits. So you have freedom of movement of your arms. You can manage the parachute. You can do as they instruct by pulling one side of the parachute and land safely on the beach. But for me, because the straps were too loose, I was up there like this. And I was quickly losing the strength and the blood in my arms. And when it came time for me to try and land myself on the beach, just as they instructed, I could not muster enough strength to pull the parachute enough to get me on the beach, and I got whisked back up by a gust of wind. And I'd already been up there for 15 minutes. They thought they were going to take me around again and that I would try it another time. <sighs> I was in so much pain that I fainted. And when I awoke, I was so disoriented and scared and, and I had absolutely no idea what to do, but all I could think of was stop the pain. So I slowly, instinctually started to take the straps off. And when I let go of the second one, I flipped upside down and then I was hanging from my knees. 300 feet up in the air over the water. I was looking down there and thinking, I'm going to die in the water. <laughs> and my knees let go. I went free falling and hit the water. And from 300 feet, it's like hitting concrete. I came to find out later that I had broken my back in three places. But then I look back and I realize, you know, it could have been worse. I could have landed on the beach. Water actually embraced me and broke my fall. And then when, it, when I came to the surface, it floated me up. Unfortunately, it floated me face down. So I was unconscious again. But this time, it was actually beautiful. I started to feel my body start dissolving into the water, and I started to become part of the water. I was moving where it was leading me. I was ebbing and flowing, and it was one of the most beautiful pe feelings to be part of this vast and powerful ocean. And I remember thinking, I could live here. I could do this. I want to be here. This is so blissful. It is so peaceful. And then I heard a voice. It said, haven't I always taken care of you? That was just what I was ready to surrender and cross over. And before I could figure out where that voice came from, I felt a hand grab me by the back of my life vest, yank me out of my watery bliss, stick me in a boat, and bring me back to land. Yay. <laughs> now, the second time I almost died, <laughs> I actually lived in New York City. I lived here. And by day, I was a preschool teacher. And by night, I was a professional jazz singer. And every Tuesday and Thursday, I would actually 
get out of the train in the basement of the World Trade Center to go teach my preschool class at 8.50 in the morning. On Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, I called in sick. Whenever something tragic happens to me, I always try and find a piece of inspiration that is going to help me start my own personal healing and hopefully help others do the same. Being in New York City right after that tragedy was a totally different place. Only two weeks before were you on the train and pressed up against five or six different strangers, armpit in your face, and you knew nothing about these people. No flowers, no dinner, nothing. You didn't even acknowledge that they were there. Yet after the tragedy, walking the streets, on the bus, in line at Gristides, on the subway, people were looking at each other. They were connecting. As if to say, I know what you're feeling. I feel it too. And to me, I had to change the way I saw the world. I had to look at the world not as this divisive community being totally separated by this tragedy, but to look at it as an opportunity for people to come together, albeit through their sadness and their grief. And I wanted to actually try and create that kind of unity again, try and bring people together again, and create that beautiful connection, only this time, not through sadness and grief, but this time through celebration. Through celebration that we are all the same, that we all want the same things. We all want to be connected. We want the same things for ourselves and our family, happiness, opportunities, security, peace. So I wrote a song, because I'm a singer. It's called We Rise. And my way of bringing people together, I had this crazy idea that I was going to build a million voice choir around the world to sing it. Why not? Come on, it'll be fun. So I left my life, my job, my career. I gave away all my belongings and left my rent control apartment. <laughs> you know I was serious, right? And I took my backpack and my guitar and what little money I, money I had and I started to travel around the world, inviting people to be part of this global peace movement. Now one of the major themes in the song when I wrote it was the notion that it takes a single drop of water to start a wave. So that was my invitation to people to see themselves as that drop, that their every thought, their every word, their every action will ripple out. It will impact those around them. And so I started to be called the water lady, the lady singing for water. And I started to get invited to conferences around the world on environmental justice, on women's empowerment, youth leadership, conflict resolution, peace, magical things started to happen. I mean, I would, people started to hear about what I was doing and I was getting airline tickets handed to me and train tickets and bus tickets. I had a woman hand me $2,000 before I got a, on a plane to go to Russia just to make sure I was taken care of. A strange woman in Barcelona, Spain, came up to me and said, you're that woman singing for water. And I didn't have a place to stay that night. And she brought me to her home, and I had a place to stay for 10 days. Everywhere I went, I was taken care of. Everywhere. And then I, in 2003, I got invited to bring the song to the Water for Life conference at the United Nations. Here I was at this incredibly important global gathering and the only reason I was there was because I happened to inadvertently use water as a metaphor in my song. That was it. But on that day, at that conference, I came to find out that there was an actual water crisis. Who knew? Who knew 
that one out of six people in the world did not have access to fresh water. Forget clean water, just fresh water. Who knew that over half the hospital beds in the world on any given day are occupied by people with water-related illnesses? Who knew that women around the world in developing countries can spend collectively 40 billion hours fetching water and not having any other opportunity to do anything else? Who knew that eight out of 10 girls drop out of school in eighth grade because there's no toilets and they start menstruating? Who knew that every 15 seconds, a child dies from water-related disease? Who knew? I certainly didn't. And that was a game changer for me. Here I was thinking that this song was leading me everywhere I wanted to go and thinking this is where I needed to be, what I needed to do for my purpose. And meanwhile, it actually transformed from being a metaphor to my cause. And it ultimately became my destiny. So by September 21st, 2004, that was the day that we invited everyone around the world to sing We Rise from all over the planet. After about two years of travel, I'd been able to mobilize over 100 cities in 60 countries to sing We Rise from wherever they were. We even had an event here in New York City. And honestly, although it was incredibly inspirational, it was also very bittersweet. Because I had to ask myself, six minutes of United Song, wow. What about minute seven? What next? What does peace actually look like on the ground? And the answer was clear, water. So I started to learn about everything I could possibly learn about, I, about the water crisis. I found out that the first Recorded peace treaty was in ancient Mesopotamia over 4,500 years ago. It was a treaty over water. I learned about the grassroots movements happening in South America and Africa and Asia of these small villages fighting back, taking their water back from the corporations that were privatizing it and selling it for profit and winning. I found, about the, found out about some of the kinds, those kinds of grassroots movements happening in the United States as well, and them not succeeding. And I started to see this bigger picture about how water affects every single living being on this planet, including the country that I came from, the Philippines. The Philippines actually is this island nation. It is plagued by monsoons, typhoons, floods, conflict all year round, and not just one a year, multiple a year. It is, in fact, the most disaster-prone region in all of Southeast Asia. And some of the biggest challenges is not so much that they don't have water, it's that they have, don't have, they have too much but they don't have the infrastructure, the local infrastructure, to manage it and to clean it and to make sure it's not contaminated. And that's one of the biggest issues in the Philippines. So I, after, at, when I was doing all my research about the water, I learned how to build a really simple water technology that anybody could build around the world if you had cement, sand, and gravel. And it was a really efficient, technology that had never been brought to the Philippines before. So when we brought it there, we knew that we couldn't just focus on transferring a technology, teaching people how to do it and then walking away. That has been a model that international development has done for many, many years and it's been failing. We had to figure out a way that it would not only be efficient to be able to provide the clean water that people needed, but it also needed to build the, and empower the community. So 
I was lucky enough to win an award from Queen Latifah and CoverGirl for women who are changing the world through music. So now I had the money, the seed capital, to start this. <coughs> and as we were talking to the communities, there were things that we were finding. We found that they don't like handouts. They don't want people to come in and do it for them. They want to be able to do it themselves. They want to be able to generate some income so that they can actually manage it and reinvest in their own community development. So that's what we did. We worked together with them to design a program where this, we facilitate a process in which they were not looking at what they didn't have. They were looking at all the resources that they did have and figured out how to harness it. So all we did was facilitate a process in which they decided what their issue was, how they were going to solve it, the technology that they were going to implement, and we helped them create an organization, an organizational infrastructure that could actually manage taking in income so that they could actually pay their staff, maintain the system, and also reinvest in their own community development. Apparently, that was considered an innovative social entrepreneurship program. <laughs> we didn't know that. To us, it just made sense. Echoing Green and Schwab Foundation and Ernst Young and Tech Awards all believed it. We started to win all these crazy awards, and it was insane because all we did was listen to the community and trust the wisdom of the community. And our plan was originally just to be there for three months, maybe six. It's now been six years. And although I'm no longer with that organization, I'm actually working now in Africa, bringing this model and working with women there because they are the ones who are most burdened by the lack of water. And in six years, over 200,000 people have provided themselves with clean water and sanitation in Asia and Africa. a jazz singer. <laughs> I, I, I was a preschool teacher. How did I get here? If you had asked me six years ago how and what I would be doing, I never in a million years would have imagined this. My pea brain wouldn't even have created something this grand and this amazing. I know you're going to think this is corny, but honestly, I think water had plans for me from the beginning. Ever since I was floating half dead with a broken back on my 20th birthday in Mexico to the time I wrote this song, and it led me here. It truly does take a single drop of water to start a wave. We may not know where we're going, but we do know that it just takes that one step. What's your drop? Thanks. OK. All right. I'm wait. Am I on? I'm on. I'm just a little drop of water in a sea of peaceful souls and I am humbled and amazed we rise
One, two, three, we rise. 